uh, ME departmental seminar. Uh, if you're just joining, sort of, uh, you know, keep your audio on mute. You're welcome to keep your video on. You can post questions on, on chat uh, and then we'll bring them up towards the end of the talk. And today we have a really uh, special esteemed speaker, Evelyn Wang, uh, who will be introduced by her PhD uh, student, uh, Solomon Adera. Okay, thank you, Rohini. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, Evelyn Wang is the Ford Professor Engineering and Department Head in Mechanical Engineering uh, at MIT. She received her BS and from MIT and MS and PhD from Stanford in Mechanical Engineering. From 20, 2006 to 2007, she was a postdoc at Bell Lab. Her research interests include fundamental studies of micro nanoscale heat and mass transport and development of efficient thermal management, solar thermal energy conversion, and water harvesting and desalination system. Her work has been honored with awards, including the 2008 DARPA Young Faculty Award, the 2011 Air Force of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award, the 2012 Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, the 2012 ASME, uh, SME Burgles Rosano Young Investigator Award, the 2016 SME EPPD Women Engineering Award, the 2017 SME, SME Gustus uh, L. Larson Award, and the 2020 ICNMM uh, Prominent Research Award. She was recognized as one of the foreign policies global rethinkers in 2017. She is an SME and AAAS fellow. Uh, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to introduce my advisor who trained me, the researcher that I am today. Uh, I would also say that she's a great advisor and that's evident, but most importantly, she's someone who deeply cares about her students. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Wang. We all look forward for the presentation and the floor is yours now. And if you have any questions, it's good if you can wait until the end so that she can uh, finish the presentation. I'll monitor the, uh, the chat uh, and we'll uh, ask her the questions at the end. Thank you. And the floor is yours, Evelyn. Uh, thank you, Solomon, and thanks for your kind introduction. I will say that it's been a privilege to be at MIT where you do get amazing students. So I've been very fortunate to have Solomon, Adara, as well as my former student, Andre Leonard, who are both faculty members now at University of Michigan. So uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thanks Rohini um, uh, for hosting this as well. And uh, what I thought I'd share with you today is some perspectives of our work and how we can engineer advanced materials for sustainable energy and water devices. So when we think about the energy landscape, we know that there is abundant use of energy for residential and commercial buildings, to that of transportation systems, as well as industrial processes. And if we look at the breakdown of the energy sources that we rely on, in fact, it's still heavily reliant on fossil fuels, such as that of coal, petroleum, and natural gas. And so there certainly are a lot of opportunities as we think about the future in terms of how we can develop cleaner solutions to help us when we think about CO2 emissions and also making them low cost enough such that they can be broadly deployed. From the perspective of my work, uh, we think a lot about heat transfer. And in fact, about 90% of the world's energy use today involves generation or manipulation of heat. And so that's the perspective that I take when we think about solving these challenges associated with energy needs. Now, of course, the other perspective is not only is energy a challenge for our, our nation and the world, water scarcity is pervasive also, which we know that about two thirds of the global population is experiencing a water crisis. So we can look at this global map and see areas that really have no access to clean drinking water. When we think about the perspective from the Sustainable Development Goals for Water, SDG 6, this really calls for this universal access 
for safely managed water. I believe there is an opportunity at this intersection between energy and water that uh, we should in fact um, pursue as we move forward. An example by which they are coupled, in fact, is shown here. So you may very well be familiar with these, which are these steam power plants. And um, the reason you see this kind of massive plume of vapor here is from the condensation process. And in fact, currently you need um, a significant amount of water to cool these steam power plants. If you look at the actual numbers, in fact, these thermoelectric power plants uh, count for about 40% of our nation's total fresh water withdrawal. The actual kind of consumption, I should say, is about 1%, but still the amount of water needed to actually cool is significant. And so this is where I believe there are opportunities as we think about the new developments. In particular, my group has focused at this intersection, not only in thermal engineering, but how we take advantage of advanced materials. And there have been a lot of developments, the fact that there are a lot of top down and bottom up type approaches with nanotechnology now to help us enhance and create new functionalities of these materials. For example, you can have materials that have unique electrical and mechanical thermal properties. You can manipulate light in all sorts of different ways now. You can change the way a surface wets or facilitates more resistance to fouling or minimize CO2 emissions via CO2 capture approaches or even developing more energy conversion and storage methods. So there's abundant realm of materials now. And I think that is an area of opportunity when we think about this bigger landscape and the needs that we face at this intersection between energy and water. So the perspective that we have been taking in my group has been thinking about how we engineer these nano and micro ma engineered materials now in a way to have the functionalities necessary to start to think about these macro scale problems and these systems that can address the energy needs that we have, the storage needs that we have, the water desalination um, needs as well in industry. And um, as I mentioned though, what we've been focused on is this coupling between the materials design and uh, the thermal engineering such that we can start to realize these larger scale systems. So I'd like to take an example, which we focused on uh, for some time. In fact, are these solar thermal power plants, which have significant promise in how we harness solar energy in the form of heat to generate electricity via a more traditional steam cycle. Now, when we examine the efficiency of these power plants, in fact, the solar to thermal conversion efficiency is about 55% efficient. And then the thermal to that electrical efficiency through the steam cycle is about 25% efficiency, efficient. And so the overall efficiency of these cycles are relatively low, about 10 to 15% now. One of the aspects we've worked on for some time is more fundamentally, how do we enhance phase change processes? In particular, as I mentioned, steam from the condensation process is one of the big challenges, right? In terms of the amount of water we use and efficiency, in fact, of the steam condenser. Um, so if we can, in fact, look at where the opportunities are to improve the efficiency of these steam power plants, in fact, a significant aspect is decreasing the steam condenser temperature, which in turn uh, decreases the turbine back pressure, ultimately increasing the net efficiency. It can be pretty significant by a few percent or so. And this is where we've spent some time for actually my career as a faculty member looking at enhancing condensation heat transfer processes. So I thought I'd share a little bit about some details here that we've pursued at the more fundamental level. And in particular, when we think about condensation, the state-of-the-art method for condensing on industrial materials, in fact, is film-wise. What it means is that as you now, now condense uh, the vapor into liquid, you can form a film. And that adds a reasonably significant large thermal resistance. So the efficiency of the condensation process is relatively low. However, in recent years, there's been interest to get um, to other modes of condensation where you can tailor the wettability to in fact create a surface that's hydrophobic. 
And you can get this dropwise mode where you can really kind of remove the droplets of water via um, the, as the droplets grow to the capillary length via gravity. And uh, some of our earlier work showed that in fact, if you can actually tailor these surfaces more with structures, in fact, you can get these kind of jumping droplet-like behaviors whereby you can have droplets coalesce at the length scale that's much lower than that of the capillary length scale. And they can eject off of the surface and you can even get higher heat transfer coefficients because you're constantly removing these droplets at even smaller and smaller length scales. So there's been a lot of range of works in looking at how we can achieve kind of super hydrophobic surfaces and how we can get more droplet modes of removal, removal modes, uh, I guess droplet uh, removal modes um, by which you can enhance the heat transfer coefficient and the efficiency of condensation processes. What I highlight, in fact, is one of the biggest challenges, however, on the right. And what you see is that over time, a lot of the mechanisms by which we use to enhance condensation relies on a coating, and the robustness of the coating is a big challenge. So a lot of the community has shifted focus to not only think about how we can create these kinds of modes of condensation, but as how do we develop more robust methods by which you can enhance condensation heat transfer. And this is where tailoring and wetting on the surfaces have a very critical role. And there's been work for, for many decades now looking at how surface topography and surface chemistry can change surfaces from being hydrophilic in nature, so it's very wetting to that of water, to super hydrophobic because of the presence of the structures. And in fact, there has been work done to now not only look at water, but other kinds of fluids, such as that of ethanol, which are low surface tension. And I'll talk more about this, but if you create these more kind of interesting in intricate structures that are reentrant in nature, you can in fact create a local energy minimum by which you can suspend droplets with low surface tension because of the pinning of the three phase contact line on the structures. And on the other hand, not only can you create these kind of oleophobic uh, droplets on uh, oleophobic surfaces on um, uh, using these kinds of approaches, but you can also create the extreme by which you can have wetting, by which you can also locally pin three phase contact line, create all sorts of interesting shapes. I also highlight some work, uh, since Solomon is in the audience, that some of his early work as a graduate student, in fact, where he shows that you can use heat as a means to tune the wettability. So in fact, when a surface should be wetting, this is, for example, water on a silicon dioxide surface, by being able to create heat locally, you can vaporize the interface. Meanwhile, the droplet is still in contact with the structures. And you get these kind of dual modes, these dual wetting states. And so there is a realm and a lot of interest in this work. And I will say that um, to be able to harness this kind of behavior is dependent on this classical wetting kind of understanding. So as I mentioned, if you have a flat surface that's intrinsically wetting, in fact, if you roughen this kind of surface, in fact, if this intrinsic wettability where the contact angle is less than 90 degrees, then you can get this kind of hemi wicking type behavior where the liquid now permeates into the, the structures themselves. And meanwhile, if you have a moderately wetting type of liquid interface with the surface, and if you now increase these structures, you can get kind of more wetting and you can get this kind of Wenzel type state that I show here. And finally, if you have a non-wetting uh, type uh, material interface with the droplet where the contact angle now is uh, relatively larger than 90 degrees, then you can in fact accentuate the repellency by using introducing the structures and get a Cassie type behavior. And there are equations that dictate this based on the solid fraction. And, and in fact, you can create this kind of regime map by which you can have axes by which based on this intrinsic contact angle theta, you can have more wetting or less wetting as a function uh, on this mapping where you see the, uh, that you can get, actually get the wicking and the repellency. So what you see here from this kind of mapping, in fact, is access to these different wetting, uh, uh, um, wetting states by which you can get Cassie, Wenzel, and Hemiwicking. And traditionally, this has been where you can access kind of um, 
the various wedding behaviors. Now, in recent years, there's been a lot of development. In fact, um, there's some work by Anish, Professor Anish Tutuja, um, who's now also at University of Michigan, has shown that if you create these kind of interesting reentrant type structures, in fact, you can start to access a regime by which when you have a wedding liquid, as I mentioned, you can still get a Cassie type behavior. And this is because of the fact that, in, that you can locally pin the contact line and because of this local pinning, you can get a local energy minimum, as I mentioned earlier, and you can have this kind of um, local um, energy minimum. And so the question we've been asking, in fact, is are there other wedding type behaviors independent of surface liquid chemistries? And so we had a thought experiment and said, would we be able to have, in fact, a same surface by which we can have repellency or in the same case, we can have wicking. And this could be interesting when we think about the context of changing the wettability of the surfaces for all sorts of applications, one of which could be related to condensation, but also in other types of selective um, wetting type situations. And so um, we can think about now, um, fundamentally, as I mentioned, if we have these kind of reentrant type structures now, as a wetting liquid comes into contact with this reentrant type microstructure with, that's initially filled with air, three phase contact line in this case of the liquid is pinned at this reentrant feature. And this effect produces a surface tension force that prevents the liquid, liquid from entering the structure even for intrinsically wetting liquids which allows us to avoid this completely wetted state. And as I mentioned earlier, you could create this local energy minimum and because of this reentrant structure. Now, if you have a surface with the reentrant microstructure starting in a liquid filled state, now the contact line pinning occurs again at the reentrant feature as a liquid is removed from the surface. And this allows you to now create a surface tension force that keeps even a non-wetting liquid within the structure, which allows us to avoid a completely dry repellent state. Instead, the surface becomes wicking. So what you see here is that in fact, again, with this kind of um, process by which you can actually achieve now local energy minimum allows this wicking. So what we've shown here in this kind of thought experiment is in fact, you can create two stable states where the local energy minimum enables both wicking and repellency, which is independent of the intrinsic wettability of the liquid and surface. So we sought out to in fact demonstrate this. And so we wanted to start off with pretty simple structures and things that we can more readily just uh, uh, fabricate in the clean room. And the process what we used is in fact, just standard micro machining type processes where you can see that the reentrant structures that we've created are made of silicon dioxide on silicon. And we wanted to ensure that the surface, uh, the difference in the materials don't affect our experiment. So we actually coded it with CF48 for all of our experiments. And what we've done here is we compare now normal channels in this case. So actually the reentrance is only in one dimension. The reason we use channels is because uh, the, the fabrication is simpler and we know that channels are, in terms of the understanding of typical wetting behavior, we have a pretty good well-established understanding of that. And so you can see here that we can compare now um, channels that we create without the reentrance. And now we have channels that have this kind of reentrant feature on them. And we wanted to show with our experiments, in fact, we can get this kind of dual wetting state with the same materials platform. In fact, the first thing to do is just examine the normal wetting uh, state that we expect in these channels. And you can see here that in fact, again, as we expected, when we have a liquid um, that comes in, the liquid that has low surface tension that comes in contact with these normal channels, you get this kind of hemi wicking behavior as highlighted also in this regime. Then we can have uh, a case where when we have a mixture of water and ethanol, you can get the Wenzel type behavior, which is in this regime. And then we get that it has the Cassie type behavior, which is shown on the bottom where you get this kind of non-wetting 
um, behavior with water, which is in this highlighted in this regime here. Now what's distinct is now once we introduce the reentrants. So what we've taken here are two cases when we have a flat surface first with ethanol, and then we have mercury. We chose mercury because we know that surface tension is extremely high. And typically it's very hard to now change the wetting of mercury to be completely wetting or, uh, or what in its wetting state. And uh, that's what we sought to demonstrate here. And in fact, once we introduce the reentrance, you can see here that in fact, that with ethanol, which has a low surface tension, can have this kind of non-wetting type behavior. And as expected, we can also have mercury behave like that. So they're both in the CASI state. And, and we can now start to access again, this regime that was demonstrated in previous work. But I think what's exciting here now is the fact that we can start to also look at the opposite case by which now you have this reentrance by which um, you in fact now uh, first fill the reentrant channels with the same liquid as that what's in the syringe. And you place the surface in a stable wicking state. So the hemi-wicking state now can extend to non-wetting liquids such as even that of mercury. So we show now that we can start to access this other part of this regime map here, essentially to start to show that even with non-wetting liquids, you can have wicking type behavior. And in fact, this has interesting implications. When we started this, we were looking, as I mentioned, and thinking about condensation. But this also has interesting uh, implications for looking at switching behavior. Can we switch between the repellency and the wicking state? And we've shown that in this inclined surface with this reentrant structure and these channels. In fact, you start to see first that first it's kind of non-wetting. Now it starts to wick into the structures. In fact, we once we kind of deplete now this uh, liquid inside, you can start to see that you get this wetting and then you can actually transition back once you introduce now um, the, the structures with now the liquid in the syringe again, and you can get this kind of non-wetting effect. And so this has interesting implications beyond, as I mentioned, the work that we're doing related to condensation. But I think this lends itself to new opportunity space when we think fundamentally about wetting and dynamic tunability when you're limited in the materials choices, for example, in heat pipes, especially high temperature heat pipes. When we think about ceramics, for example, and how you kind of can enable still wetting of materials often using kind of liquid metals. And so that's been an area of interest to us for some time. Now, if we look at it um, now, the real challenge when we think about condensation, in fact, is that we know that when we have structures typically that are hydrophobic in nature and interfacing with water as it condenses, that it almost fails, always fails, and it locally transitions to this kind of Wenzel type state. And part of the challenge, I will say, is you can see that even if you have these kind of reentrant structures, that in fact, over time, now there's so much nucleation that happens in between the structures that this lends itself to inevitably this property loss of this kind of uh, uh, um, wetted state and leading it to a wetted state. And um, so we were looking at, well, what can we do in the context of creating these kind of reentrant uh, structures by which then we can in fact potentially enhance condensation. Um, and this is where we have been looking at now further improving our structures with the, having these reentrant, um, uh, still having the reentrants. However, now changing slightly instead of having microchannels or micropillars in this case to that of cavity like structures with reentrants. And what we've shown here is that now you can get this kind of non wetting behavior as you now uh, condense water onto these kinds of surfaces. And I'll just briefly show you how we do this. So the way we've done this, as I mentioned, is now instead of having these kinds of channels or that of just pillars with reentrance, we've introduced cavities. The whole idea here is in fact that we wanna separate sufficiently the nucleation sites on the surface. Once nucleation uh, sites are, um, are too close together and they coalesce, that's what lends itself to the failure of the wetting. Um, and so in this case, 
we've looked at what is the appropriate nucleation spacing as a function of the nucleation density and design structures in a way to help us now prevent the coalescence of these droplets at a particular superheat or subcooling, I should say. And um, in this case, we've demonstrated now with this kind of design that in fact, we can achieve condensation resistant omniphobic surfaces as we start to now look at um, these um, uh, reentrant type cavity structures with length scales that are relatively small, so we can in fact separate nucleation sites more effectively. You can see that um, as you start to subcool the surface, in fact, you can still maintain for larger subcools this kind of non wetting type behavior. In fact, you can see this also in our ESEMs, our Environmental Scanning Electron Microscope images, which suggests there is an exciting opportunity here. One of the challenges we still face, which is something we've been still working on, is a hysteresis. So for, for these kinds of water droplets to be removed off the surface still is in fact um, reliant on um, the hysteresis. And so this is something that still is important as we think about how we minimize that hysteresis and the contact of the solid with the liquid um, to be able to now further enhance the condensation processes. So that's one example that I share with you focused on wetting. And I thought I'd share with you a few other examples, one of which is focused now coming back to the solar thermal power plant, in fact, is on the receiver side. And how do we improve and think about new concepts of solar thermal receivers? And in fact, a state of the art right now is using parabolic troughs, for example, which receive the heat from the sun and reflects it onto a tube that heats up, which has a circulating oil in it, to then drive the steam cycle. An area that we've been looking at, in fact, are aerogel-based solar thermal receivers. Um, this was initially funded by ARPA-E about starting about five years ago, where uh, Gong Chen and I worked collaboratively on these efforts. And the whole concept at that time was, can we now replace expensive optics and reducing the need for concentration or as significant a concentration with these kinds of optics and develop an aerogel solar-based thermal receiver design. The idea here was with the aerogel, we know that it acts as typically a very good insulator. However, at that time, we were unsure whether there could be an optical transparency that's necessary to allow effectively the incident sunlight to now come through and heat up this black absorber and minimize the losses via the design of this aerogel as an excellent insulator. And the idea here is also the fact that if we could conceive of this type of approach, we know that um, potentially you can get very high efficiencies in an air stable type design um, that is in contrast to often these vacuum tube type um, configurations to minimize the heat losses. So the whole concept was in fact create this kind of aerogel solar receiver design by which then you could eventually also uh, integrate it with heat storage. And in our concept, the idea was to get rid of these parabolic troughs and use linear Fresnels, which have lower concentrations and hence lower cost. And um, early on, I will say that we've done quite a bit of analysis looking at the performance and cost trade-offs compared to the state of the art. As I mentioned, one of the, the challenges as we, uh, of state-of-the-art is in fact that relies often on these kind of vacuum tubes. And when we look at now kind of what the receiver costs are and the needs for the optics associated with it, you can see that with our concept, in fact, that you can actually, you can actually reduce the levelized cost of electricity by about three cents per kilowatt hour. And so from this initial analysis, we were convinced that this is an approach that we can take. However, at that time, I will say that there was a lot of interest and unknown as to whether you can truly tailor these materials, in particular the aerogel, to get the optical transparency that we needed. And in fact, commercial aerogels look somewhat like this, where it has this kind of bluish tinge to it because of the scattering of the, the, the silica aerogels of these particles and the non-uniformity of the particle distribution that lends itself to this kind of bluish tinge. And what we have shown through many iterations of development is in fact, we can in fact create these optically transparent 
thermally insulating aerogels, as you see here as an example prototype. Um, and it looks almost like glass. In fact, um, uh, it actually has higher solar transmittance than that of glass as shown here. And the thermal conductivity we maintain is very low. So it's less than about 0.1 watt per meter Kelvin and can be robust up to about temperatures about 400 degrees Celsius. So this is how we started the project. And I will say that uh, we've had many groups of students and postdocs that have gone through this, whereby one of the demonstrations we showed early on, done by my former student, Dr. Lin Zhao, where he showed that if we can interface this uh, low scattering aerogel with a black body absorber, in fact, and this is non-evacuated again, we can show that in fact, it can have very good performance without any concentration at all. So in fact, if you look at stagnation temperature as a function of time, using a thick a, an aerogel that's about 20 millimeters thick, in fact, you reach a stagnation temperature over about 225 degrees. And of course, if you now change the thickness, we know as you get to thicker insulations, you will get to um, better performance. And in fact, we've reached a record high stagnation temperature using one sun with no vacuum. And this is just a black absorber. So there's no selective surface involved to about 265 degrees Celsius. And this has been exciting for us as we think about now various applications that could take advantage of this kind of temperature range for industrial processing in particular, whereby we can use these aerogels as a means to generate heat to dry various types of processes. We've also shown this outdoors, and this is an example on a very cold day at MIT on the rooftop. And we show that while the ambient was less than one degrees, it also shows very good performance reaching about 220 degrees um, Celsius at the stagnation temperature. Of course, um, as I mentioned, one of our goals is to actually demonstrate this integration into a solar thermal receiver. And so that was what we were tasked to do using this with this ARPA-E project. And you can see here, the idea was to tie all these aerogels into this receiver design by which you have these pipes that have circulating oil through it now uh, to emulate the actual system. And we actually built this. Um, you can see here, this is about, because of the way we've created these aerogels, we had to tile them. It's about one meter in length, about 10 centimeters wide here. And we interfaced it with a linear Fresnel array. Um, so I will say this was a non-trivial effort uh, to build this kind of system. In fact, a lot of the efforts for about two years were focused on leakages of the pumping system for our oil and building actually the infrastructure. So uh, systems are, it certainly gave us an appreciation of how difficult it is to actually integrate into a system. Uh, but I think ultimately, in addition to the learnings, I think that suggests that in fact, this kind of aerogel concept has promise um, this shows um, the receiver efficiency as a function of temperature, and we compare it in the case using our aerogel compared to that of no aerogel. You can see clearly there is significant advantage for having these aerogels because of significant reduction in losses due to the presence of the material. And as we sought, sought to kind of integrate this ultimately with a typical cycle, which is on the order of about 400 degrees, this is kind of where we uh, left off in this project. I will say there have been many opportunities ahead as we think about this kind of material and how we can utilize it for all sorts of applications. One which I'll highlight in fact is work done here now with um, Professor Leonard and Das Gupta, where I know there was a really, really nice paper that was recently uh, uh, published and thinking about how we can potentially develop these aerogel monoliths that are stable at even higher temperatures. And so there has been really nice work done in looking at atomic layer deposition as a means to help stabilize these aerogels. And so I encourage you to look at that and, and also talk with your, the faculty here at, uh, at Michigan. Another area is what my student, Elise Strobach, has now spun out as a company is envisioning now how we might interface these aerogels for window applications. Because we've been able to get such high uh, performance in terms of the insulation, as well as also minimizing the scattering. And you can actually get pretty um, haze-free aerogels, aerogels in this way. And uh, so she's been pursuing that as an opportunity for her startup called AeroShield. 
And finally, I mentioned there are also other applications. Once you have this material, um, my, my student um, also looked at how we might be able to take advantage of this aerogel um, for medical sterilization. So using a non-tracking uh, type um, concentrator is just essentially aluminum uh, metal sheet and in a non-evacuated solar uh, collector, in fact, you can start to think about how we can utilize these in developing world areas where medical sterilization is so critical. And uh, so that just gives you another example, I think, of some of the research that we paved and thinking about demonstrations and opportunities when you can engineer these materials and also design them accordingly with in the perspective, particularly for us with thermal engineering, it lends itself to a lot of interesting opportunities. So for the last part of my talk, I thought I'd switch gears a little bit. As I mentioned, a lot of the, 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 the opportunities we see is often at the intersection between energy and water. And so I thought I'd share some work that we've been doing also for some time now and how we can harness the air from um, our environment to now harvest uh, water. And, um, and this is something that we've been working on, as I mentioned, I think we started in 2017 and it had been many evolutions of this. And I thought I'd share a little bit of this story. We know that water in the air is a resource that's equivalent to about 14% uh, of the fresh water in lakes on earth. So about 13,000 trillion liters. So there is an abundant amount of water in our, in our air. And um, while there's been work for some time in thinking about how we can foster or harness that water from the environment, in fact, if you have very high humidity type conditions, in fact, you can use nets. You can actually capture the fog and it can be very uh, energy, it doesn't require any energy at all. Now, the more traditional approach when we think about um, water harvesting, in fact, are doing based atmospheric water generators. They've existed in the market for some time. And the whole idea is, in fact, you use a refrigeration cycle. So you refrigerate, um, you use a refrigeration cycle, you get below the dew point, and by which then you can now collect the water. Um, and uh, this is, of course, important in certain regions because dewing can be relatively efficient in high humidity conditions. However, it does still take electricity in this case to be able to generate the water. And when we look at the mapping of the kind of global relative humidity, you see that in fact, the world is faced with all sorts of different relative humidity ranges. And so while the doing based approach is the state of the art, as I mentioned, it really works well for high humidity conditions. One thing that we've thought about, again, is the fact that solar energy is quite abundant. And in fact, in a lot of the water scarce regions that um, there's a lot often abundance of solar energy. Um, and so this is where we thought a lot about solar powered atmospheric water generators and doing the analysis uh, in, in terms of how we interface potentially say um, solar panels to that of these refrigeration systems you find that in fact, if you were to do that, if you calculate the thermal efficiency as a function of the relative humidity, that as you get to lower and lower humidity conditions, you see that doing becomes infeasible because of thermal, thermal um, efficiency here. And so this is where we've been targeting in terms of, can we think about other approaches by which we can harvest water from the environment that is not um, so energy intensive in this case. And this is where we have focused a lot on adsorption and desorption processes. So the whole concept here is if you take a material, somewhat like a desiccant, for example, and if it's dry in its dry state, if you have vapor in the air, it's gonna naturally want to now, now uh, adsorb onto the interface of this material. And in this process, then you can actually capture the water molecules onto this material. Now, the question becomes, well, you now have captured it, now how to release it? And this is where we believe that a, an effective approach is if there is energy in the form of heat, in fact, you can release the water and then ultimately have a local area of vapor that's concentrated 
by which then you can condense at ambient conditions. And so this is really the concept that we were looking at to now consider an approach by which now that relies on adsorption, desorption, rather than doing processes. And so when we started this, we proposed this concept um, that in fact, it's highly dependent on the materials choices. So um, the material that we were initially looking at are these metal organic frameworks. This is in collaboration with Omar Yagi's group at Berkeley, by which now when you have this dry metal organic framework, you can capture a reasonable amount of water at low humidity conditions, dependent on the properties of the material. And again, once you have sunlight, for example, you can shine the light and it provides heat to now release the water and condense it near ambient conditions. And the key, as I mentioned, is really in materials choices, components, design, and ultimately how you integrate it. The more traditional kind of adsorbents, such as silica gels or that of zeolites, have isotherms that are not as ideal in terms of the water uptake characteristics. So what I show here, in fact, is an example of the isotherm for silica gels. You can see here, in particular, when we're thinking about water harvesting at low humidity conditions, now the water harvesting capacity, when you think about the ambient being about 25 degrees, and now the generation, uh, regeneration, about 80 degrees Celsius, the, the water harvesting capacity is relatively low about 0.1 kilograms per kilogram or less than that. And similarly with zeolites, which are more traditional materials, um, it's pretty limiting. And so really this concept relies on the harvesting capacity of the materials design. And as I alluded to already, what we focused on in fact are metal organic frameworks as our first proof of concept. The reason is here you can see that this isotherm this water uptake as a function of, relativity, of relative humidity is much more promising because it has this kind of sharp increase near this humidity range. And so, in fact, you can leverage this kind of um, approach by which you don't require a significant temperature difference, right, to be able to now harvest the water from the environment. And that's really the concept that we've been pursuing, this kind of approach. And in fact, there's also a lot of work, not just on the materials design, but also of how you actually define the layers to maximize the kinetics. So the heat and mass transport are really critical in this and how you can now deliver the most amount of water is highly dependent on the kinetics of the material and the components. So we've done a lot of characterizations and also computational simulations to help us design these um, devices, which I don't have time to get into. But our first proof of concept was actually pretty small. You can see here that we demonstrated um, a single layer of these metal organic frameworks. One of the big challenges here, I'll say, is scale up of these materials. To get the kinds of performance at scale has been a challenge. And how we integrate this, and we, our first concepts were showing droplets, essentially, of water that we've been able to now harvest because of the small amount of metal organic frameworks that we used. And through the evolution of this, I will say that we started working in more kind of arid climates. So we tested our device at Tempe, Arizona, knowing that in these scenarios, the dew point actually can become negative. And in this case, the doing type approaches really are infeasible, right? And so we wanted to show the advantage of this approach using adsorption and desorption in these very extreme climates um, where doing would not work at all. And so we've done quite a bit of optimizations of the devices. We were still working at single layers at that time because of the scale up challenges that we faced. And um, through the evolution of this project, I will say that in fact, we've been able to demonstrate now more efficient kind of uh, harvesting of the water. What you see here is when you look at the window of, this, um, of the condensing surface, and in fact, the first fog is up, and you only start to now because of all the kind of water now that's condensing on all the surfaces and it heats up over time. And then you start to see the actual surface. So we've been working on this and we were, as we kind of advance this uh, kind of the device design forward, we realized that there are still further opportunities and we wanted to start to show new concepts of actual device design. 
And um, that's what we've done most recently. In fact, we were looking at a two-stage type water harvester instead of having that single layer as a proof of concept, by which you know that there's heat generated in the condensation process that can then drive a subsequent layer for desorption to happen. And so we integrated now um, adsorbents that we can now obtain at a larger scale as we've been working more on the research side to develop the kind of ideal materials. And so we started with Aquazoa zeolites in this case, which are commercially available by Mitsubishi. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of the key things, as I mentioned, is not just uptake, but also the intracrystalline diffusivity. And what we saw is that while the, the uptake is not tremendously high, still one of the really big advantages of the Aquazoa, in fact, is the intra intracrystalline diffusivity that allows us to now cycle more and allow us to now produce more water. And that's what we've done here to now develop a prototype. You can see here, it's a larger scale, about 16 inches, inches, inches on each side. And now we have tiled four large adsorbent layers. And because of the fact as there's adsorption happening, there is also a need to now, um, um, and desorption, you actually have to reject some of the heat in the process. And that's why we've interfaced some of these uh, fans that are important in this process. And in fact, that's what we've shown here now, that in fact, you can see that we've been able to collect with this kind of two stage based device about uh, 50 to 60 milliliters of water. So you start to actually see an amount that you can actually measure, which has been an exciting development. As we move forward, um, we've been, in fact, uh, we've done some characterizations, as you mentioned, um, looking at the temperatures and looking at how this matches our model to better understand how do we further improve the water harvesting productivity in this case. We know that the two stage will definitely perform better than a single stage, but there's still many opportunities as we think moving ahead. And uh, a few examples of considerations that we've realized in this, in fact, is that there are many material properties that are really critical as we think about how we optimize these adsorption-based water harvesting devices further. Also at the component level, when we introduce these kinds of materials into actually a packageable form, a key aspect, in fact, is how you actually make them into layers and what the thickness of the layers are and how that lends itself to what's the intracrystalline diffusivity, et cetera. And so there's this interplay between, in fact, the materials at the material level, the component level to that of the system performance, which we've been actively pursuing. In fact, right now we have a DARPA project that's focused on this for compact water sources for soldiers, which is even more constraining in many cases. But I think there are opportunities abroad uh, as we think about the general space of water harvesting. In fact, I found that a recent review, uh, a recent paper uh, that was done by Google, in fact, was published showing that if we could do, if we can use this approach of atmospheric water harvesting, in fact, we can address the shortage of water around the world of about a million to two million people, right? And it maps out what is that kind of this yield in terms of the water as a function of the humidity. And it maps out, these are the kind of the, based on the simulations that Google has done and where we are in terms of state-of-the-art type technologies based on the materials choices. And I think this suggests that there's a lot of potential in this of course, as I mentioned earlier, the scalability, the cost, these are all aspects that still need to be considered as we move forward. So I'll end here and say that there are certainly many opportunities for these advanced materials. In the context of my work, we've been focused a lot on the kind of heat and mass transport challenges and how we interface the materials to start to think about these exciting systems that can address the energy and water challenges that we face. And there's still opportunities though, when we think about this, as, as we improve the performance of these kinds of materials, components, devices, how do we scale up these materials in a way that we can reduce the cost and still achieve the performance, enable the robustness that allows us to actually make them practical. So with that, I very um, uh, really lucky, as I mentioned, to have just a tremendous group um, through the years that have enabled us to do these really fun projects and these uh, interesting materials design challenges, as well as looking at the system level challenges
And of course, the funding that supported a lot of the work through our time and the tremendous collaborators that we have to be able to also share ideas and execute the research. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Evelyn, for the great presentation. Uh, and uh, any question from the audience, you can post or you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put on the chat. Go ahead, Neil. Hi, Evelyn. Great, uh, great presentation. I had a quick question for you on the um, water harvesting. So I imagine if you integrate over the entire atmosphere, there's a lot of water vapor. Um, but I'm wondering locally in desert environments where you're already scarce with the relative humidity of water in the air, is there any potential negative environmental consequences to further harvesting water in terms of local desertification being accelerated in areas where you know, moisture in the air is already like a, a sparse uh, resource? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. I think something that we want to pursue further. I think this is something that I think holistically, like you said, like uh, the net water that you extract compared to how much actual water in the air is really small, right? Um, I, I think there were some calculations done. It's like less than 0.01% or something like that. Right. Locally, though, there could be some effects that need to be studied more. And uh, we are trying to team up with people that do kind of do models that can help us better understand these uh, local kind of challenges, especially, like you said, with the arid climates where already they're very arid. Does that have a really uh, big challenge in terms of the effect of the climate overall right, and the environment? And so that's a good question. We don't know the answer specifically, but that's where we would like to do some more detailed models and partnering with others to understand that um, and, and see how, how it looks um, for sure. Okay, thank you. Jose has a question. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, Ms. Wang, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, towards the beginning of it, um, you were speaking about um, uh, these sort of solar thermal plants, um, you know, it involves a uh, turbine, lots of reheaters, heaters, things of that nature. And um, as, like, as far as what, as what I've been taught, I, I know that, um, like you said, the phase change of water is you know, very efficient. Uh, well, not efficient, but very powerful for, for heat transfer. And when you're seeking to increase the effic efficiencies of these types of machines, um, is it more affected by sort of thermal energy, uh, like loss to the environment? Um, like, is, are there a lot of environmental factors or is it more internal with things like entropy generation and the actual mechanical systems? Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a really uh, good one. I, I would say that I think when you think about the, the efficiency of the systems, there are many components that contribute to that, right? And certainly some of it is loss, right? For sure, that's contributing to that. To that, so you can see here. I, I just come back to this, and I think you'll see this and highlight some of the factors, right? That um, that contribute to it. So it's almost every component as you actually now transport um, and convert, right, uh, from uh, steam to back to liquid. There's a, a lot of these different aspects, right, that can contribute to the uh, to the loss in efficiency. So I would say, generally speaking, uh, there are various, uh, I guess it's, it's uh, ultimately, I guess, um, uh, all uh, uh, kind of ultimately related to the design of the various components and fundamentally there will be kind of uh, entropy generated in all of this as well. Thank you so much, I appreciate your time. I, I can ask a question um, in, with, on, on the aerogel side. Uh, I know you mentioned a few times that you know there's there's something that we that, that needs to be done to minimize uh, scattering losses. What is the what is the general approach to achieve uh, that outcome? Like, what are maybe uh, general design principles there um, to achieve that outcome? Yeah, thanks, Rohini. Um, we spent a lot, I guess, um, I think we knew the tailoring of the distribution and the size was really critical. Mm -hmm. The key is how do you do that? Yeah. 
And um, let me see, I might have a slide here. Uh, I can get out of this, sorry. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to optimize uh, these materials because it was certainly non-trivial to understand. In fact, in a lot of experiments, you start to realize that some of it is sometimes uh, trial and error, but also some luck as you start, um, as you start, uh, here it is. Uh, can you see this? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And uh, you can see here, we found that as you go through the aerogel synthesis process, one of the key elements to create kind of tune the particle size mm -hmm. is by the catalyst to precursor ratio. Mm -hmm. So what we found is if you get higher, uh, the higher the catalyst ratio leads to the smaller particles because you have a faster reaction rate and this kind of depletion of the precursors mm -hmm. um, that avoids this kind of Oswald ripening effect. Mm -hmm. And so we actually did quite a bit of work and understanding this optimization to help us now control at least one of the critical parameters in this case mm. when we were creating this kind of aerogel. Um, and uh, I think this was uh, important uh, actually when we were trying to republish the work, I think there was a lot of questions as to how come you were able to achieve it. And I think yeah. we were early on doing this work with a little tri trial and error and we didn't really do the systematic study. Mm. But as we got further along, we, under we actually happened to be in the right uh, regime in terms of this catalyst to precursor ratio allowed us to get there. Okay, thanks. Um, Anish, Anish has a question. Hi, Evelyn. That, that was a fantastic talk. Um, oh, thanks. thanks so much for coming here or, or presenting for us. There's so many, so many cool things going on here. Um, I had a general question, sort of it feels like you, you presented the first part on condensation and the third part on sort of water harvesting. Have you sort of combined both of those for more energy efficient uh, water harvesting by using much lower degrees of subcooling? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a good question, Anish. I mean, I think they're all related. Um, and I think uh, uh, a lot of the exploratory week work that I showed in the first part, I think we haven't gotten to a point where uh, I think they're at often the scales that we want to implement them into our device our devices, you know? And so that's kind of been, I think we have to bridge those still in a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, and I think it depends on what's limiting in this case too, right? And I think often when we think about these, for example, this, uh, sorry, this water harvesting type device that in fact, the condensation probably is not the limiting uh, step. So we don't put a lot of effort in trying to really further tailor condensation processes there, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it really depends if what, it depends on when you look at the design, what becomes the bottleneck? And that's where we really focus, even though um, you could potentially um, in, integrate them further as we get to more advanced designs as well. Thank you. Any other question? Um. Larson has a question. Yeah, if I may, thank you, Dr. Wang, for your time and the really engaging presentation. I, you, you know, are talking about addressing so many of these interesting um, and very important societal problems and that require scale up. And you reference some of the challenges that come with that. And I was curious how uh, that those challenges of scale up maybe influence or inform your scientific process and in pursuing the really fundamental or enabling science for some of these? Yeah, thanks for that question, um, Larson. Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of the philosophy that we have pursued in our lab is we try to um, start in understanding what the problem is and then what it is that uh, uh, you know, could enable us to address the problem in impactful way. So for example, um, you know, uh, we worked on this water harvesting approach, right? And we said, oh, we really want to now um, extract water from environments when they're very humid in, uh, sorry, not humid, very arid in nature. But wouldn't it be great to have a material that could do this and, uh, you know, based on state of the art that we didn't know what materials existed to be able to do that effectively, right? And so this is where we said, okay, well, 
we're not experts in materials per se, we use them, but can we now partner with other people that are experts in materials and explore the material space and say, is this possible? And maybe you can get the humidity, but maybe you can't get the uptake and kind of understanding what that requires. It's almost like bridging the fundamental science to understand how you actually create these materials and what exactly is happening in these materials. And then ultimately then eventually coming back to the problem, but knowing that you know, right now the materials are not scalable. So there's these compromises that we make, right? So, um, but I think a lot of the, I would say a lot of the, the key breakthroughs and advancements comes from being able to kind of discover new things at the more fundamental level and ultimately then bringing them back to uh, addressing the problem at hand. So I don't know if that's uh, helpful, but so it's almost like they have to somehow meet in the middle at some point. But at least the way we, the philosophy of our lab is always understanding what the problem is first and then trying to come up with a solution that in some cases don't really exist, but yeah. trying to conceive of ways and exploratory approaches by which we can then try to tackle them. Thank you, thank you. We're at two minutes past five, so maybe we should uh, officially close the session. This was a really excellent talk, Evelyn. Thanks so much for your time and thanks for taking all the questions. Um, uh, thank you so and, much again. And it Great. was a thank pleasure you, everybody. having you. Thank you. It was really nice to see everybody. And sorry, I'm not there in person, but hopefully I'll get a meeting yes. with you soon. Next, th next time we'll be in person when things get better. Thank you. Good seeing you, everyone. Thank you, you. Thank you for care. attending. Good. Mm -hmm.